Okay, great. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our GIG community call. Today we have with us uh, a very special, two special speakers, uh, Tatkesha from the co-founder of the Pranava Institute in India and George, the strategic advisor from uh, Lawyers Hub in Kenya. He's currently based in Marseille, friends, but this is where uh, Lawyers Hub is, uh, uh, where the headquarters of Lawyer, Lawyers Hub is. Um, today we're going to be talking about creating trustworthy digital futures, and I think this is a super interesting conversation that needs to be and should, I think, is being held at different places and different locations uh, at the moment. Um, and we're going to specifically be discussing um, the crucial link between behavioral sciences and deceptive practices, uh, what insights to have on human behavior that can inform us and, uh, and inform the creation of manipulative designs. Um, so I will, at this point, give the floor to Tatkisha. Can you introduce yourself, your work? Hi, Fatia, and hi, everyone um, at the Gig Network. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so just very quickly to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jitiksha. I'm co-founder, and I currently lead research at the Pranava Institute. We, um, we are a research-focused organization that works at the intersection of emerging technology, policy, and society in India. Now, um, we do, of course, two broad things. One is we do a whole lot of research around uh, what we think are crucial issues and topics around digitalization and digital policy. There's a lot of focus in India, but also on the Asia-Pacific region and also on global issues, which we think that all of us could get together and collectively think about. Um, so we see ourselves as uh, as a very research heavy organization in that sense, but our um, but a lot of our work is not just academic or policy papers, but also multimedia outputs and more specific um, products that we create um, to help other stakeholders uh, and groups um, understand um, what's what's happening with emerging technology. Um, uh, would you want me to talk a little bit about our project at this stage, Fatia? Or... Okay, perfect. Um, so if it's okay, I'll just very quickly share my screen. Perfect. So um, I think, I, think uh, I just very quickly wanted to discuss uh, a little bit about one of the projects that we've been working on. Uh, for the past year and a half now, and this was essentially centered around um, deceptive design. Now, um, on this call for people who are watching now or maybe uh, who are attending now or maybe watching later, I think um, all of us have at some point on our in our digital interactions, um, we've lost privacy or our data without really knowing it. We've wasted our time trying to get something done. Um, and getting uh, lock jammed into an interface. We felt tricked. We've lost social capital by sharing something which we thought was authentic and true, but is not. Uh, we've been denied choice. Sometimes in, in our digital interactions, we've experienced discrimination, especially if you are someone from the global south and you happen to be a part of the minority communities. Um, you would have definitely, I think at some point, all of us have lost money trying to buy something um, online. Um, and we've often been emotionally manipulated or shamed online. This is typically something that happens when a pop-up tells us, oh, um, so you want to, you know, um, you want to keep ads as if that's something that we are choosing to do out of our own volition. A lot of this happens because of something called deceptive design. And deceptive designs are, uh, they were, for a long time called dark patterns. It was a term that was coined way back in 2010 by Harry Brignall. Uh, but since then, the field has evolved a fair bit. So these deceptive design practices are carefully designed to alter decision-making by users um, by tricking them into doing actions that they do not intend to take. And these have found um, themselves a, in, into a plethora of online experiences today from e-commerce apps, social media, fintech, education, you name it, and it's probably some sort of manipulation exists online. Now, um, these design choices, they don't just have harms baked into them, which 
uh, impact consumers, but they also have harmful implications for larger digital ecosystems, including uh, loss of consumer trust over the long run, as well as impacts on privacy, which is um, increasingly being addressed as a very strong intersection. So um, in our work about a year and a half ago, we set out um, looking at two questions, essentially. Um, we started our inquiry by trying to understand persuasive design, which is very well understood within the design community in general. Um, but our understanding was, our questions were twofold. One is one we wanted to understand how deceptive design plays out in the Indian context and in the global South countries, because most academic literature which we came across was focused either in the European Union or it was focused in the United States. So we wanted to bridge that gap and see, hey, how do consumers from, from countries where digitalization is rolling out now, and you have uh, perhaps people who are coming online for the first time, they could be um, vulnerable, they may not have access to digital education per se, right? Uh, how are these, these deceptive patterns impacting them? So that was the first sort of leg of our work. And the second leg of our work was, True, we could have, we have a lot of these conversations happening between several experts across the fields of privacy, design, and, uh, and human computer interaction. But a designer who graduates from design school, um, you know, either in new media and ends up working for a technology company is absolutely unaware of the consequences and harms of the things that they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do we create something which is usable for a design practitioner and helps them understand the challenges and harms that occur from deceptive practices and nudge them and help them think through around how we can create interfaces which are more trustworthy? Um, that's essentially what we set out to do. Now, um, because of the time that Fadia has given me, I will rush through some of these slides and get to, um, um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, very quickly, an ontology of dark patterns, a deceptive design patterns by the OECD several years ago have been categorized into, categorized into seven broad buckets. And these essentially link back to certain, um, cognitive biases that all of us as humans have. And I think the speaker after me will fo focus a fair bit on uh, on those cognitive biases. So um, what? Uh, let me share some of the findings from the work that we have been doing and um, you know what 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 we found out through this. So harms from deceptive design practices include loss of data and privacy loss of time in gaining access to services or completing tasks, or even psychological harm such as stress, anxiety, or addiction, which are now increasingly being studied in longitudinal um, research. Now, um, these deceptive patterns impact users differently. So factors such as age, location, or socioeconomic class, language play a major role and can often increase vulnerability of users creating greater harms. So in our research, we found out that language, for instance, in a country like India, plays a huge role in how deceptive design could occur. Often we would see that e-commerce app, for instance, have all of their interface in, in a regional language which a consumer can understand, but a lot of the privacy policies and other kinds of um, data-related um, issues were often made in, or were often presented in um, complex legalese. Um, and in English, which is something that they may not be aware of. We also realized that deceptive design is not limited to screens in the way that we traditionally tend to think of them. And there are a whole lot of deceptive patterns which are now um, occurring, or the same patterns are now being seen across newer kinds of interface, such as voice, right? Um, and this specifically has been the case with um, Amazon Echo and Amazon Alexa, which are extremely popular in India. And we are seeing that how the same patterns which prevent you um, from um, exercising your rights as a consumer online are also now part of these voice interfaces and chatbots, for instance. One of the most highly documented harms that we came across were financial loss. And several cases of reported financial loss included suicides, from um, excessive um, emotional manipulation of people who were unable to pay back loans, which they did not clearly understand the, understand the terms or conditions of at the time when they were signing up. And this is a huge gap per pertaining to not just language, but also uh, digital literacy that we are um, seeing play out. And therein, of course, it links to harms to life and dignity, right? Um, 
Loss of sensitive personal data, I think, is perhaps the most well known, and a lot of people listening here would have had personal experiences themselves of sharing really sensitive information um, across a whole range of apps, right? This could, of course, include your e-commerce apps or just signing to buy a pair of socks and you're just asked like a whole bunch of personal questions, including your birth date, including gender. But this becomes a lot more tricky when we look at special cases such as period tracker apps, which are essentially logging your uh, biological rhythms and a lot more sensitive personal health-related data for women who use these, right? Um, we're also seeing how um, this impacts access to education for a lot of students, making them sign up. Um, and in, in the ed tech sector, we've seen a lot of malpractices around deceptive design, uh, which make people overpay for services which they uh, do not have the affordability to. Um, and two more important, more significant structural harms that we, of course, found out were that over a long term, even very simple deceptive design practices can cause immense user detriment, right? So it's almost like um, it, it's it's a way of thinking and a, a bio memory that these deceptive patterns essentially play on for humans. Um, and therein, even if we create policies and laws which protect consumers online, because the behavioral level change has already occurred, those can often be very um, limiting in their use. Um, this is just a very quick mapping that we did of deceptive design to consumer harms and the structural detriment here were weakened or distorted competition, right? So large platforms which use these practices are able to amass huge amounts of data from users and thereby um, able to create a uh, weakened competition in the digital economy and of course um, create, um, you know, lead to less consumer trust. Now, um, the cost for digital users of something like this is global, right? Um, and I talked about a few the, few of these, but um, this issue also impacts inclusion and accessibility online, which is very important for all of us as we think about digitalization. So language and access, of course, increase vulnerabilities for users who are not English speaking in a rather majority English speaking internet, right? The, the web is still extremely disproportionate when it comes to language. Um, of course, one of the most vulnerable groups that we were able to identify with research, not just in India, but also in the Middle East and Africa, was that first time digital users in these um, countries were a lot more vulnerable to falling or falling prey to such practices. And finally, um, there are special groups which are impacted in ways and uh, which we don't think about generally. So this is about, for example, assistive technologies and specific communities like those who are visually impaired. They use, for example, web accessibility tools to make the internet comprehensible and accessible to them. But often these very web accessibility tools have deception layered into it, which let's say a user like me who does not use them would not be aware of. Um, so those were some special cases and special communities which require more research and attention um, from our end, right? So, um, and what does this require from us as a community, right? 2022 was a great year for deceptive design from a policy standpoint, because a lot of regulators across the world woke up to the challenge. The Federal Trade Commission in the United States and um, the Digital Services Act in the EU after, the EU of course has had a long history of trying to look at um, deceptive design. And um, very recently we've also had India, India's um, Ministry of Consumer Affairs issue a draft guideline banning certain kinds of deceptive practices. It's the first step in the right direction. And, you know, uh, we at the Institute are also engaging with the regulator in India to see how that approach can be, uh, you know, improved upon. But what we essentially need is to make, to strengthen our privacy laws and make data protection meaningful for the last or for the end user right? Else we could have a lot of data protection laws and authorities in the world, but unless we also tackle this particular challenge, those, those rights are not actionable on the ground. We also need to regulate unfair digital practices online by extending our current legislations to include um, digital malpractices. And this is also something that's happening uh, with more competition authorities taking up the issue. And finally, we need to strengthen consumer protection in ways which is um, more meaningful and also applies to the digital realm. I, ha I can go on for a lot, but I think I'll pause here and pass it on to Fadia. 
Thank you very much. Very insightful. And I think this really makes a very good learning uh, introduction to our audience today, because I, for one, am not an expert in this area. And I think your presentation was uh, very clear and simple into explaining um, our, our online reality. And with this, I will hand over to George. Um, George, please introduce yourself and your work. And if you also have any comments on Tetkesha's uh, presentation, feel free to do so. Thank you, Fadia, and uh, thank you, Titishka. Thank you, all the participants here, for uh, the opportunity to, to share a little bit of reflection, thoughts about the dark patterns. I didn't, I didn't knew they they used to call it call it uh, dark patterns. I, I think uh, uh, they should keep this uh, name because in somehow it puts like thinking about cognitive bias and all that. It puts you. It it creates this association of thinking about something that. It's not positive. Um, uh, I apologize, by the way, I am in a co-working space, so you might hear some voices around me. And uh, just to keep a little bit on that, uh, this idea of uh, uh, deceptive design, I, I think is, is a manifestation of uh, manipulation uh, or persuasion, if you want to call it in a more polite way, which is superhuman. It's, uh, it's in the human nature, I think, completely embedded. I will I will go on more on, on that. Uh, and let me introduce myself. Um, uh, my name is Jorge Clark. I come from Chile since uh, almost more than 10 years now, living in Europe, uh, in the middle, I live, uh, I also lived in Kenya for a while. Currently, I'm working as a strategic advisor for the Lawyers Hub since almost a year now, uh, but I am familiarized with the work of the Lawyers Hub uh, in Kenya since 2020, when I met uh, uh, Linda, the founder and CEO, Linda Bonjo, uh, in the first, in, in I organized a conference about uh, the manipulation of the voting, like voting system, Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica scandal, and so on. Uh, thanks to this, I got to meet uh, Linda. I invited her as a panelist. Then she invited me for the first Africa Law Tech Festival. And since then, we have been uh, discussing together and since a year now, working together. And not exactly on the, at the same level of details as uh, the work Titish, Titishka, uh, you have uh, you have been doing with the Granada Institute, uh, but more on the policy side is the work uh, lawyers have have been trying to to push since their existence, and I think if I have to put this in in a couple of lines, uh, the main contribution has been to raise awareness, level up the discussion, and announce the discussion around law, policy, and technology since five years now. And this, for example, uh, has led us to contribute uh, a lot to data protection issues, data privacy issues, uh, regulation about artificial intelligence, and so on and so on. Everything in the context of East Africa, but in, a, in with a large ambition to to be a, a to have a Pan African scope, and I think we come again to to what Titix just said. Like uh, you have a lot of studies around this in I don't know USA context, Canada context, uh, European context, but not that much in the Latin American context, Southeast uh, Asia context, India context, uh, context or African context. And the problem is that uh, what is happening in this digital era is that the whole South hemisphere is basically to a 99% maybe consuming services and products that are made and tailored uh, for North hemisphere people to North Hemisphere people. And so here is like the, the I think, a really good contribution of, of lawyers have is like a, 
we need to do something like as African continent, we need to do something around this and people need to be aware about this and not just uh, policymakers, decision makers or just lawyers, but this is okay, the main scope of the work we do, but this should be larger. We should include civil society organization, just people around the street and people from other uh, uh, professions, like uh, people with a more technical profiles, engineers, developers, and so on and so on, to be aware of this. And ideally, to move to the next step and start creating the tools necessary to build regulations with the local context into consideration, something super important that uh, Titiksha pointed also, local context. And also learning from the mistakes from uh, from the North Hemisphere. Uh, so with this, I, I close a little bit uh, the, the, like lawyers have has been doing other stuff also in the training part and services, but this part of the relates more with what we are discussing right now. And to take as an example, uh, I remember in, the Africa Low Tech Festival, I believe, 2022. Uh, I don't know if you know a woman who's called uh, Shoshana Suboff. Uh, she, cre uh, she created a book. She studied a lot, uh, the, a concept that she developed, which is uh, a surveillance capitalism. In her presentation, uh, there were very insightful idea, but I could go along for hours just discussing about her presentation. She's incredible, incredible, super smart woman. But one point was take it into consideration that all the digitalization of information in the North Hemisphere started, let's say, starting 21st century. And so until 2020, for example, you have 20 years of big companies using this information to literally manipulate consumer behavior. Uh, at some point, they at the beginning, they just use it, the data that is, that is directly related with each individual. And they disregarded more than 90% of the data, which they call it residual data. At some point around 2010, they say, why don't we use this data, which is contextual data and so on and so on, et cetera, et cetera. Data that at first glance looks not so directly related with an individual, but it was recorded anyway. Until that point, it was disregarded. And all these big tech companies started using this uh, residual data. And they improved all their prediction models incredibly, enormously. And they realized, oh man, so uh, we have like a mind goal here. And on top of this, they start working with uh, something that we may call dopamine engineering, which is exactly how you will build the, the little processes inside our services, inside our products, to make them literally addictive. And this is the way they discovered the famous like button, which was for the industry like a revolution. Nobody expected that this like button will have such an impact in society. And the point is that Shoshana Suruf in the Africa Low Tech Festival in 2022, she mentioned that the North Hemisphere has these lots of lots and lots of data and 20 years of being used by uh, the big tech companies in this sense. But in contrast, Africa is starting to be used. And the message she tried to pass is that the African continent, or in general, the global south, should learn from this. And instead of waiting 20 more years to, to start writing the proper regulations to control this, they should start doing this right now. 
So they reduce this gap of 20 years of being manipulated to just, I don't know, five years of being manipulated. That's one message. Uh, second second point that I, I want to add here, and I, uh, I am a little bit ashamed because I didn't prepare a slide, but I take uh, what Titish said about cognitive bias, and I want to share my screen just to show you exactly that. Uh, you see my screen, isn't it? Yes, perfect. So you can just type on Google uh, cognitive bias codex and you will find this. Uh, it's a not so easy to understand tool, but very illustrative tool of our human flaws, very uh, ingrained in our human nature, cognitive bias. They are decomposed in, in, in different categories and they even develop an example. Too much information, what we do when we have too much information, when we don't find meaning in something and we need to ask like, how can we create this feeling of you need to make something now? This I think this is, we need to act fast is a is a good uh, example, especially in in purchasing behaviors like uh, how all these platforms in somehow they manage to create this sensation in our brain. It's like you need to execute your uh, shopping now because if not, you are going to be losing something. What is happening behind all this story behind this is a lot of behavioral science engineering or a uh, dopamine engineering, as I said, it's like you construct a user path, a user journey. So at the end of the journey, the user feels more and more of this sensation, like saying, you need to click, you need to buy, and you need to do it now, because if, if you know, if you don't do it, you are going to be losing something. All that is tapping in our cognitive bias, in our very human nature. And uh, I will finish with an uh, anecdote, if we might we may say, and, and how this is so intrinsically related with the human. Uh, this may sound a little bit ridiculous, but it's true. In Latin America, uh, when colonizers arrived, arrived Spanish colonizer, colonizers, and not only, and they find a really effective way of buying lands to the local indigents at a very, 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 very low cost. And the methodology was as follows. They start developing a relation with the local indigents. At some point, this relation built a little bit of trust they invite them to dinner offering, uh, I don't know, nice and interesting scenario uh, for dinner and a lot of alcohol. With the colonizers not drinking too much alcohol until the indigents were almost completely drunk. And at that point, they invite them to sign documents selling their lands at ridiculous prices. They did it. Many times this is recorded. And what happened the day after, these people realized that they no longer own their lands and that the, here there is a document that credits that this lands you sell it to this person, I don't know, for one or two pennies. That was a sort of manipulation 500, 400 years ago. And what we are seeing today, as Titiksha mentioned, how this is happening in India, in uh, Africa, or in Latin America, is an evolution of this. Uh, over, obviously, much, much more complex, but it's the same. It's how can we take advantage of other people? And the problem is that the market allows this for happening. So if society itself or... Uh, uh, the, the the governments don't react and start building the necessary regulation for this, 
which is what we are trying to push with Lawyers Hub, we are going to keep suffering from this. Amazing. Thank you so much, George. What a, a very inspiring start for our call. And this uh, link, um, this analogy that you used between the deception that was used, deception methods uh, during colonizing times and deceptions that are being used now online through different tools uh, really struck a chord here. So I would love to at some point even highlight that um, at some point. But before I do this, I see we have Linda with us. And I just wanted to, to welcome her, first of all. And just, uh, I cannot but ask you for for your comments, your impressions about this. Like, this is a topic that's very close to you. And uh, uh, it would be great to hear your your insight on it. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much. And um, I would, please forgive me, kids are home. <laughs> so there will be background noise. But Jorge has done an amazing job just talking about the work that we're doing at the Lawyers Hub. And then also... So just drawing parallels between Latin America and Africa and India. I think there's great opportunity for us to work together. Um, I find publications very easy to scale as well as conversations. And I would say that within the African continent, um, this is not happening. There's not much writing on dark patterns. There was an attempt to do a publication by an organization in Nigeria, but it was very focused on Nigeria. And one of the work that I think the focus we're trying to do now is to really get towards an Africa, Africa as a single digital market, and then also to look at Africa as a single digital harms sort of society, because Europe takes the same, the same sort of approach. And we're really hoping that the study of maybe various countries in Africa really gives um, a, a greater insight into what the patterns and the trends look like within the African continent. And of course, if you compare the population, you know, between India and and um, and Africa, I think we're about 1.5 billion, um, you know, so we are sort of equal to India and the size of India, um, you know, um, as one sort of entity. But I think the strength that we are seeing is in terms of when there's a, a huge tech market, then tech companies listen to regulations. But in frag fragmented markets, they don't listen to it. So we're really hoping that Africa gets to the point where we are not a fragmented market, but we're just one market that ideally can hold, you know, tech um, um, companies and you know um, actors accountable on the basis that if you want to access this market, then you have to comply with these rules. It's worked for EU. I think it's worked for India to some extent, especially with like local ownership laws and things like that. And we hope that we can get there. Um, so I think um, that was a very interesting conversation to look at, but I would say that on our end, there's goodwill on um, what next in terms of conversations, what next in terms of working together on projects and looking for partners and funders, and also just being in a community that would then understand these issues. We are really big on capacity building uh, because we think that knowledge should be democratized, that it should not just exist in a few pockets of society, because we've seen that the more that we teach people these issues, then it expands to journalists writing locally about these issues. Uh, we see that more lawyers are litigating. Um, and so there's always an impact on the conversations that we are having. Um, and so I'd say, I think on our end, we're really happy to collaborate and Bohi is here. Um, you know, you sent me a message and I was like, what call? Uh, because there's like a million calls today, uh, but I really am grateful for um, the possible work that we could do together and the potential that this holds. So thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. It's uh, always great to have you and see you very inspiring to hear your talk also. Um, I mean, this really leads me to maybe the next point in the conversation. What are the obstacles? So we're talking about uh, the African continent, um, uh, India, and parts of Latin America. What seems to be the common pattern, let's say a dark pattern in that sense that leads to the obstruction of a process um, towards a safer internet, safer and trustworthy online spaces for this part of the world? And the question is really directed to any of our speakers today. So. And maybe actually we can also take Nadite's point before we move on, because I see Nadite, you raised your hand. Nadite, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was a great presentation, everyone. Uh, really enjoyed it, learned a lot. I was going to ask Linda, uh, she mentioned the fragmentation of the market in Africa 
And I'm wondering if there is um, going forward, uh, first of all, what are the obstacles? Why are why the fragmentation? I mean, I understand in, in Europe, it, there is the EU, so they have that going for them. And then in, in uh, India, it's one country. So I imagine that's easier. Um, so besides that obvious point, what are other um, obstacles uh, that stand in the way or are creating that fragmentation of the market? And then the second question related to that is how are we going to deal with those obstacles? And like, is the path forward, how soon can we get to the point where it's not so fragmented? I would, I would say maybe quickly to your question, one is on capacity. I think we have a continent that uh, the digital skills gap is lacking um, and even more the digital policy skills gap. Uh, is really is really huge. Uh, for the past four years, Lawyer Hub has been running a digital policy uh, fellowship every year to develop talent in this area. And we're seeing that a lot of the talent that we have developed is being co-opted even into big tech companies that are looking to hire. Um, and so we'd say that um, it's, the, it's the challenge, but it's also the huge opportunity that how can you build capacity that's scalable across the continent? There are various ways we're trying to do that. And we can discuss that at various um, levels. But also so that we live in a, a continent that's data deficient. And so we currently do not have a lot of data on. People just say, I feel I feel we're not covered. I feel there are many dark patterns, but the policy research is really lacking and the digital policy research. And so a lot of the policy interventions are very haphazard. They don't have justification why people are doing certain things. Um, and so if you couple up the data deficiency and look at it from uh, the lack of capacity, especially for policy makers, where you tell them this is the problem, they don't call it for what it is and say, okay, these are dark patterns. They will simply just say, you know what? Um, they'll sometimes even blame the, the users and say, you need to be more careful online. You need to stop this or they would ban it. Like what we're seeing is more platforms are just being banned arbitrarily when ideally it should not be um, really denying services, but then looking at ways in which you can have more consumer protection mechanisms on these particular platforms. So I would, I would say that um, those two are the key um, um, you know, challenges. But then also, finally, on fragmentation, we have a fragmented continent. We're about 54, and just to be politically correct, 55 countries in Africa. What that means is we have different laws for these 55 countries. Yeah. We may have continental interventions, like, for example, the Malabo Convention, which is like our data protection law, and it also covered cyber, cyber crime. But it's not efficient uh, to cover this because also countries have to adopt it as legislation so it's not just looking at it from continental you also have to come in and um, adopt it as a treaty within within your ecosystem so you see that's that's a challenge that's a, a second challenge but then every single country you go to the standards are different the standards in nigeria are different from kenya from south africa wherever it is which is super different with the european union where there's faster standardized level of having a GDPR framework, or if you're looking at AI Act and stuff like that, but then at the level that you go to next is then now you go to country level. So we do not have that for the continent and we are suffering for it in terms of policy and regulation. Um, and so what, what tech companies would do is ideally look for a more friendly country that ideally has very weak um, regulations and then work from that particular country. Um, and so, that's, that, that's, that's not possible. Data protection commissioners have tried to come up with a continental framework in which they only license, let's say one tech company, and so they don't have to do it in 54 countries. But that's also being fought um, and being seen as a tech capture uh, because tech companies now want to make it just easy to bribe 55 people rather than uh, 55 countries. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what I would give in terms of uh, feedback. Um, but the opportunity to, for us to have more data and more research and publications, which have more context. Because however much you write about India, somebody writes about New York, if we're not writing about Africa, really the way we use tech is different. Our challenges are different. Our cultural context, um, the use of tech is also very different. Um, so I would say data, but then also too, how do we build capacity and make sure that um, more and more people understand uh, these issues. And I think for us, those two are the, like the crooks of the work that we're doing right now at the Lawyers Hub. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, that was great. Um, something to think about. <laughs> so 
Ms. Kesha, would you like to also comment on this from um, the Indian perspective on, on what I would say semi-continent of India? Um, what are the main challenges to get uh, safer online spaces, better national regulations and policies around this topic? Absolutely. And I think, um, thank you, Linda, for sharing some of those things. I mean, I, I think it's it's very instructive even for someone like me who, who would very much want to, you know, um, get to know people working in the policy space in, in Africa as well. Um, and two very quick things before I come to Fadia on the things that on, on the points that you were making, Linda, that popped in my head is number one, I think we need more 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 south south cooperation on some of these issues, which is more meaningful, where countries like countries like India and also the African nations can perhaps share capacity, can do training programs together. Um, the the tech policy space in India is also fairly new, right? Um, in the sense we we at the Pranava Institute are also in the process of curating a, a program for young professionals, specifically taking up uh, and curating something which would put these young professionals in you know into into training for three months where they intensively go over a lot of issues and skill building around tech policy. Um, the second promising thing that I have seen in the last two years is I think number one the fact that under India's G20 presidency for the first time we had the African Union become a part of G20 and I think that's that's a very positive step in in India trying to say, hey, you know, yeah, as a as a very rapidly growing economy, we have more space on the table and we want to share that space with other countries who we think, you know, you know, we we have moral solidarity with in some ways. And the second thing, um, and I'm just going to drop a link here on the chat to that, is um, something um, that that's been happening on around India's model of digital. Um, on, on public digital infrastructure. So the DPIs, which are now going global, um, I think India signed MOUs with eight African countries um, in, in the last two years. Um, Kenya, uh, of course, being one of them. But um, I, I so with the DPI initiative, the idea is how can tech help, help um, you know, these countries leapfrog um, over several generations of technology and specifically keep in mind their developmental contexts, right? Um, since developmental contexts such as financial inclusion and access to public services is something which is shared um, between these economies, um, there is definitely scope for cooperating here. Um, and I think initiatives like those are things that I, I feel, you know, uh, are steps in the right direction, but would definitely want to engage more and find out about your work at Lawyers Hub and perhaps also see if we can do some of this together. Um, to your point, Fadia, um, well, there's a whole lot of challenges in India as well when it comes to tackling deceptive design practices. Um, honestly speaking, deceptive design is a very specific problem, right? And that's how even like how Linda mentioned, right? Regulators have a lot on their plate in, in these countries. So deceptive design is perhaps a very teeny tiny problem that they're going to solve. And so they will look at, of course, uh, there, is, there will definitely be a need for prioritizing, you know, which of these harms do we start tackling first? And I think that's why regulators look at something like financial harms very prominently because um, they want, you know, financial inclusion is perhaps one of the largest agendas for a developing economy anywhere in the world. Um, a couple of things that come to mind, which I think are obstacles in India, and the TPI is also involved in the policy space. And so we do recommendations to government bodies and regulators in that sense. One is, I think, um, a stronger data protection law. So we are we passed a law, but we are already in the process of setting up a data protection authority in the country, which will take about twelve months' time, um, and and those will really help. But also, I think sometimes, um, like like somebody mentioned, I think uh, Pony mentioned this that you know we we really need to learn from some things that did not work in the European context. And I think one major learning for me on this issue has been the fact that. Till the time we um, we we don't create mechanisms where different kinds of regulators can work together on digital issues, we will not really see very effective policy coming out. So in the European experience uh, of deceptive design, what we have seen is you've had a lack, a severe lack of cooperation on um, how to tackle deceptive design, how to define these problems, how to protect consumers, how to create redressal. How do you even go about finding what these patterns are and telling companies that it's unlawful to do this. 
So um, this is definitely something I feel that that India can learn as well. So instead of going outright and banning a particular kind of deceptive design, which is a very blunt and rather, it's a regulatory tool that doesn't make much sense. Um, it's, it's much better if we look at this in a more holistic way as both a problem and as well as, you know, work together with multiple stakeholders in the policy system, but also outside of it to create new solutions, um, which work. Hi, Fadia. I have just one point on here. Uh, George, thank you very much for your uh, explanation, your showing of the reality, you know, and it's very interesting to see that even though in our in our more sorry, my son is playing video game. I have to ask him to stop. Thank you. <laughs> All right, sorry. Uh yeah, you all right. Uh, sorry. Uh, the whole idea of decolonization, it's all around ourselves, you know, our groups, our inner circles. But overall, the main idea around Europeans and legislators is still a colonized one, you know. They are, it's still an idea of uh, expanding, extracting, and getting the knowledge, getting the, 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 the content, whatever, you know. Uh, so I do agree with what with Tikisha said, you know, to strengthen the South-to-South -South cooperations between legislators, uh, between policymakers, between leaders on the fields, you know. Uh, and it's also very super crazy, you know, because we cannot, uh, there's a really, really famous word in the reggae music that says the oppressor cannot become the oppressed, the oppressor. The ones that suffer the oppressors cannot begin become the oppressors themselves, you know. And when you see this new international politics together with India, Brazil, South America, it's cool, but it's not that cool, you know, because it's 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 still colonizing, trying to expand and strengthen these things. So I don't have the answer, of course, but I I love it. The, the panel today, I love the perspectives, and it's quite important to understand that all this decolonization press process and de Eurocentrism process that we can see in the world is still very few compared to what is really happening, you know, because up to now, and what George said and what I said in the chat is that we still have 500 years of colonization, and it, it didn't change, you know. So it's it's a horrible perspective, but do we know our enemies? You know. So thank you again, George and Tikisha, for the the session. It was impressively great. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, everyone, for sharing the links. I think a lot of uh, references has been talked about today, and I can see uh, people posting the links in the chat. So feel free to save them. Um, I I mean, we have five minutes to go and I just feel so compelled uh, in my role as the community manager in GIG is to talk about what can we do as a community? Uh, how can we move forward? How could we build bridges between your work, Titkisha, um, in India and your work, George, in on the African continent and Linda's work? Uh, how could, what is needed at this point? How do you think our very grassroots group can have um, implications in the bigger reality in the in the world out out there. Any recommendations, suggestions? And I I think that, that after listening to Ricardo and uh, like. With the last question he pointed out, like, who are our enemies? And I think at, at some point, uh, we have to accept that our enemies are, are ourselves. And this uh, colonization perspective, I think, is strongly related with the human nature, not 
obviously this is not everyone at the same intensity some humans more some other less but it's this human nature of uh, ambition or addiction to power so once we have a power asymmetry and a group of the population that uh, is in power with respect to another group of the population most likely to happen is that they will not want to change condition and balance everything they will just would like to keep this going on and they they will if this little group of the population start to realize about this they will try to look somewhere else to do it to do this you can take for example any a uh, any other industry, for example, mining industry. In the mining industry, I don't know, do mining extraction in Canada. And at some point, the, co the government of Canada realized that, okay, we will ask you a royalty of 15, 20% uh, or 30% on the production. Okay, they will keep working because the mining in industry need, needs to survive. But at the same time, they say, okay, where can we go to extract uh, minerals? and pay less. Let's go to Peru. Let's go to Chile. Let's go to uh, Bolivia. They go to Chile, for example, and the mining royalty is less than 5% and not on production. It's on uh, uh, sales, which is ridiculous. Not even in sales. It's in the margin, like uh, in the earnings. Uh, and, and then, for example, the tobacco industry. Uh, we were, for 20 years, invited to smoke. They even advertised tobacco as uh, you are going to be handsome, you are going to be sexy, you are going to be a better lover. Uh, teachers were allowed to smoke cigarettes in the classrooms. 50 years later, we realized, okay, this is not cool, guys. We need, this is really damaging something and people and ourselves. So the market allowed for this to happen also. So you see a business opportunity and people are on, on this, they will go there. And with the digitalization era, artificial intelligence and so on, is happening exactly the same. So I wonder myself, what are we going to see in 20 years from now, looking back to today, saying the same we say today regarding the, cig the cigarettes, the tobacco industry. What are we missing right now that is super harmful for society? And in that sense, what can we do? Of course, we need to strengthen the South-South connection a lot. And and, and I think all, all those sounds like little stuff, but I think it's the natural first step is to enlarge these type of situations and, and try to make people aware of this, aware of, of our very human natures and how our very human nature is being used and today is being strongly used by technology. Mm -hmm. And so this type of intents should be multiplied. And if they are multiplied and, and I don't know, if, imagine you can create an, an app that every day allows you to see how your language is not inclusive. Every day in it, it tracks all your emails, everything you do. And at the end of the day, it's a, yeah, you know, your score for today is, I don't know, uh, four out of 10. The language you are using is really biased. It's non-inclusive because of this, this and that. And if we have, if we go through this every day, maybe that will change something in our brain, and we will start changing to have a more inclusive use of language. Maybe using a more inclusive use of language will create other change. I don't know, but if we if we look for a solution, I think the starting point is this type of situations, and then try to make them more frequent and keep pushing the discussion. Zai, do you have your hand raised? Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, no, I was just going to uh, add, and maybe I'm just wondering. I It's sort of a question. Basically, I am wondering if the state, uh, the state, for instance, like African states, if they had better capacity, better understanding of the situation and things like that, I would imagine that would help. So build. would you say building state capacity uh, would be helpful as a potential long-term solution to this problem. Yeah. 
it's Keisha. Maybe you want to go for this last. Yeah. Oh, it's 10 a.m. <laughs> And someone else raised, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, it was me. <clears throat> I was reflecting on the question from Nadaid. And I think it also requires a lot of like the right values, so to speak. So um, seeing in Kenya, for example, that just knowing about digital technology and like being very, like having a lot of capacity in this regard, that's not really helpful uh, because then there's like the government is so influenced by big tech and by um, non uh, like non local tech um, basically like Silicon Valley but also a little bit Europe and uh, probably also China a lot but yeah generally of this big tech influence uh, and so um, I think just the the um, development of the local civil society is the, the super important and crucial step uh, to balance this a little bit. So um, that would be my my answer. And of course, it also helps that the government knows what they're speaking about generally, but then they need to have this uh, kind of balancing mm -hmm. out and lobbying from local mm -hmm. grassroots. I think you would, you, uh, I think, in general, uh, it's not it's not a hundred percent good solution or a hundred percent bad solution. It has downsides, downsides and upsides. I think it's good for uh, decision makers and and and, and law makers uh, to be aware of this. But at the same time, you need the population to be aware of this because if not, you create again this asymmetry of knowledge, asymmetry of powers. And I think you have thousands of examples over the earth where. Uh, policymakers are aware of something and they understand how to make a business out of this because the population is not aware and they do it. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, uh, you have this education at the policymaker. You need to have this type of education at the scrutiny level. And civil society organizations, the population, th they need to understand. This. And so again, but this is make this a huge challenge of education. Okay, thank you for that, guys. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on what you asked today, but in, in the interest of time, and I know it's three minutes past already, but um, I think there are two quick things I would want to say. One, I feel, is um, something that I've observed both about India. Uh, perhaps it's getting better now, but it's been a long-standing trend, and from what I understand in Africa, too, um, a challenge of, you know... Um, getting local funding and independent funding for both civil society as well as groups and networks that work on technology is crucial. So building those bridges between local industry, local government, as well as people who work in uh, work on different parts of the digitalization problem is really important. Um, for example, in India, one of the challenges I see is that a lot of our think tank or policy space, which influences policy making, is funded by big tech itself. So, um, and, 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 and those entrenched networks essentially make it very difficult for, um, for the policy ecosystem to stand up on its own right and push back against some things that, you know, we, we don't want uh, big tech to be doing in, in the country. That's one. And I, the second thing, um, Fadia, to your question on, you know, how we can perhaps leverage gig is I think calls like this are great. I mean, I learned so much about what's happening in the African ecosystem, which I wouldn't have learned from reading papers or reading the news. So I think a great starting point is this exchange that we've really started to put together. And um, one vacuum, which I personally feel, and this is something I want to uh, work on over the next few years, is how do we build more emic and indigenous um you know, visions of a digital future. I still think, yeah, we're talking about tech and we're talking about these local efforts which is happening, but what is our vision of what this digital future looks like? I think the visual, vision is still pretty much imposed and it's a borrowed imagination from the West in many, many ways, unfortunately for us. So uh, I would love for this community so, to sort of get together and start thinking about, you know, and, and, and this is a hard question. It's gonna take us a long time to really think um from those from from our own philosophical systems from our own ways of thinking knowing and being in the world on how one what place do we you know we we guard or we regard technology to have in our lives 
Um, and that being said, on a more practical note, I do feel that, you know, it would be great to connect with people who like, like the ones who like, you know, today shared so much on this call to sort of come together and perhaps do projects together, perhaps research together or write together, um, ap apply for grants um, together to sort of strengthen this voice um, together. Thank you so much, Satkisha. Thank you so much, George. That has been uh, very, very insightful. Thanks, everyone that attended today. Again, as I said, really hoping to start getting um, more into the field um, for for privacy and, and design and all the non-makery things in gig. So hopefully we'll have more uh, calls around this topic to also uh, activate our members. Um, and I think it's very important also for this multidisciplinary approach so that people that are very technical working on things have a good understanding of um, your your field of work and vice versa. Um, one last uh, note. Yes, I'm reading here, gig policy and research calls. Amazing. And one last note, I just um, mentioned this earlier in our WhatsApp group. We're going to start a fundraising WhatsApp group that is dedicated for what you're talking about, Titkisha, what we hope would uh, flourish into that, that members are, I mean, we're being, members are always sharing open calls for, for funds and um, different deadlines, different places, different uh, scopes uh, and eligibility criteria. but we'll try to organize this in one place and hopefully see these kind of collaborations. So I'd personally be very happy to see Pranava Institute and Lawyers Hub maybe working together on something at some point, co-writing a proposal. Um, and we're happy to see if we can assist at some point with this. So just stay tuned. Uh, I think it's today or tomorrow that we're going to launch this WhatsApp group. And this these groups can only live with your contribution. So it's meant to be from and to and with the community. So it's not really a gig team member thing. It's a community space. So just wanted to um, highlight this. And George, I think you can also be added to this particular WhatsApp group if you would like to. I would love to. I would I also just, you just tell me what should I do and I do it. I will get in touch. <laughs> Let me first uh, start by turning off the, the recording and just say last goodbyes.